right. Well, welcome everybody to the uh, Power Lunch. We have Catherine Reed with us. And Catherine, I'm going to do the best I can to say this the right way. Uh, out of I fig. Yeah. Did nice. I do it? You did it. <laughs> been, honestly, the people from NetV Pro will attest to the fact that I've been rehearsing that all week. I love it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've been, you've literally been top of mind for me. <laughs> so, like, I can't. so, because I'm from Wisconsin, I want to say Adobe. But, Adobe. We get Adobe a lot. But, right. but uh, it's out of eye. <laughs> I'm very proud of myself. It's out of eye. <laughs> and, um, um, this is Catherine, and she's the owner, founder, and uh, you know, Grand Yoda of Adavai Fig. Is Grand Yoda a title that we could maybe we put that on a business? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's on my business card, so I, I know you saw it. But yeah. so um, we'll let uh, Catherine talk a little bit about what she's got going on there. Maybe uh, a little background. I, I honestly, it's a great name. It's a unique name. I've been thinking about it all week. So maybe get a little bit about the name because I know there is a. Uh, story behind the name so yeah there that, is. and then tell us a little bit about um servers to service and what that means to you and your business and and all that and um, as usual uh if you have questions feel free to ask them and we'll have a little conversation at the end but uh i'll turn it over to you Catherine, and tell us a little bit about yourself sure thanks thanks keith um like keith said my name is Catherine reed i am the founder of adobe fig i'm just kidding out of i fig <laughs> uh now i'm just going to confuse keith uh so my background my background actually was initially not in technology i grew up in a in a super nerdy family my mom was a communications officer for 30 years in the air force uh, my dad was in it my brother is a implementer for anthem health in in technology and i was going to be really cool and go into like health and fitness and all those good things and then got out of school i studied health promotion my first job out of school i essentially became a technical project manager by accident <laughs> so i got put into a role with an admin team and they said we have this programmer who we can't talk to we don't know how to communicate with him and he said you guys have a business team that i that doesn't understand if this then that and can't understand what's actually possible in the technology world so I kind of fell into like the mid role of being a translator. So I would work between the two groups and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with this idea of actually taking technology, not just for what it, it's useful. I mean, it's cool and things like that, but actually using it in business and applying it. Um, so I went back to school, got my MBA and MIS from UNLV uh, in Las Vegas, and then uh, worked in the kind of IT consultant world for a while. And after that, for a few years, I felt like I was doing a lot of traditional technology. So I was putting in servers, I was working with teams to run cables and we were still using physical hard you know, phones on desks. And I wanted to see more of a shift to the cloud. And I mean, we'll talk about this kind of as we go through this, but the cloud is not new technology. How we're using it is new and, and there's different things that have made it more useful. But I mean, the concept of using the cloud has been around for you know over 50 years almost. And so we, I was seeing a lot of businesses kind of stuck in this really traditional use of technology where small businesses, you know, less than 20, 30 employees putting in physical hardware and then getting frustrated with it. And so I had this kind of idea of, man, I just think we should all be just working. Like we should be able to work where we just grab a computer, have internet access and go anywhere in the world to be able to run our business. And so this idea of, and I, I would kind of break into this, of this idea of servers was not just like hybrid model of servers where maybe they're on site or maybe they're in their cloud, but any servers, any server that has to be patched and run an operating system and supported, truly just completely replacing and using services, software as a service, cloud services, uh, Google Workspace, Microsoft 365. And can we, and the kind of discussion that I love talking about is, is it, uh, feasible for a small business to truly eliminate any type of server and just go to cloud services. Uh, so my company, Adivai Fig, kind of had that model of this idea of really focusing on cloud-centric businesses. Um, Adivai Fig, the name, comes from um, Adivai is adore and vita, so to love life in Latin. And then Fig comes from um, a, a book or poem called The Bell Jar. And it's a little bit of a solemn read, but in it, the author talks about sitting in the crotch of this fig tree and looking up and seeing all these figs. And one fig is uh, an Olympic champion and one fig is a writer and one fig is a, you know, a mother and, and, a, and a spouse and kind of goes through all these different figs. 
she can't decide which fig to partake of. So she just sits in this crotch of the fig tree and they all wilt away and die, which is super sad to think about. But to me, it represented, you know, we sit so often in our business and in our lives at that fig tree and just kind of say, like, I don't want to make a decision or I can't make a decision or so it just became, um, you know, people have all sorts of really cool passions in life, like sports and music. And, and my passion is technology. I mean, I wish I wish I could make some really cool motivational video about how great tech is, uh, but it really became my fig and helping businesses kind of achieve their mission or their fig with the application of technology. That's kind of the, the background of the name. You know, the backstory, it's a very interesting metaphor and the concept of, you know, I, and I think I kind of articulated a little bit with analysis paralysis but that yeah that leveraging of i don't even i don't even know if i want to say available resources but I mean, like i said it's i after you know the backstory it's a great analogy so is that part of your elevator pitch when you're talking to businesses is telling them about your name or am i just the only nerd who's interested in that you know i don't i don't usually offer it unless someone asks just because it's it's kind of a lengthy it can be a lengthy explanation, um, but I wanted I wanted the name to have meaning for me personally. That when I look at it each day, it kind of reminds me of, you know, staying focused on what it is I'm trying to do. Yeah, well, that's cool. Very good. Yeah. Well, I don't. Do you have um, a presentation to go through a little bit about about your organization I, or? I do like have to... some, you know, slides that I'll, I can. We can kind of keep them off for now, and then maybe I'll share. Do I have the ability to share my screen? Oh, let me just take a look here and. See, I think we default. No, you do. You're ready to go. Okay, cool. So I'll kind of, I'll keep it off just for a little bit, maybe while we just kind of introduce the topic. And then I do have a couple slides I'll throw up. Um, but kind of to go back to this idea of, you know, really discussing, discussion being, thinking of our kind of technology that we support typically in the IT world. And when servers, again, whether that's on site or putting in cloud servers, data center, Azure, AWS, things like that. You know, and thinking through the question of, is it feasible for small businesses to go truly serverless, to move over to services? Um, so I usually like to start of just like a history. And, and this might be, you know, things that if your background strong in technology, you know a lot about. But for like small businesses who might not be as familiar, um, I love to talk about just like, what's the traditional workplace look like? Like when we think about what is the traditional workplace look like? Eight to five physical desks. What kind of comes to mind for all of you? for what are we supporting? What does the workstation look like? What do users expect? What do employees expect? You know, one of the things that, like who's calling? Not, not like, <laughs> I mean, just in general, is it, is it an IT person that, that has a desire? Is it an owner? Is it like, what type of, or is it all? Like who, who reaches out to uh, your organization to work with? Um, so it's typically, operations, right? I mean, to me, and that kind of goes back to the traditional workplaces, our HR admin operations people are trying to make a decision to say, I don't care how the work, I mean, I don't care about the gigabytes on this and the megabytes and the speed. I just want it to work, right? I have functions in my business that need to take place. It's like that whole discussion of benefits versus features. Uh, we get so focused on explaining the features of something and all they care is that it can show me this beautiful picture in less than two seconds. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're more, the, they're transitioning away from the classic, I'm gonna worry about buying servers every three years and storage every three to five years. And they're more saying, this is the compute I need. This is the speed I need. This is the capacity. How can we do this a different way? Is that kind of what you are encountering or is it something well, different? And I would say even like the, that breakdown that you just gave of these are the speeds and this is that, they're actually saying, I need to open Excel. I need to get on a Zoom call at the same time. I need to do a PowerPoint. And if I get bored, I need to jump over to a YouTube video and watch it over here at the same time. And I, so I want two monitors and I want it to all work at the same time. So in terms of like hard drive space and speed of some, sometimes those discussions take place. But a lot of times, again, it's those benefits of like, this is what I need to do. What is, I don't care the technology that does it. Can you help me figure that out? Like what should be the technology? So you're actually you, helping. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, so when we kind of get into that discussion of, well, okay, where do you work? Do you want to have the ability to work from anywhere? Do you want to, you know, are you in the office for, because you have to, because of your technology or because you want to for collaboration? Um, Cause I think being in the office is a great thing. I mean, I think that there's a relationship building that takes place. But I think being in the office because you have to, because your technology doesn't allow you to, to work somewhere else, 
may not be a great thing because then you get less flexibility when somebody just needs a week to work at home for a period of time or travel and things like that. When you're working with businesses, do you find that at some point during your uh, discussion of you know, how you can help them, is there an aha moment that they have? And, and if so, what is it? Or is it, or is there not really an aha moment? It's more of a moment. Yeah. Um, so and maybe we can go into this a little bit. Like to me, the cloud is still very misunderstood. So usually the first aha moment is like, what is the cloud? <laughs> like just really explaining it in a way that someone can understand of there's cloud, like the basic way I explain it is like there's cloud computing and there's cloud services. So when I'm talking about is cloud services. So sometimes when we think about like when I can get a client to understand, like we're not talking about managing servers still in the cloud, but now it's cloud computing and in private cloud and public cloud. And, high, and then a lot of times I lose them. You can see it in their eyes. <laughs> we're talking about, hey, you need to open up this file because you're in sales and you want to be able to travel. Well, what if I said, okay, you have a computer, you have internet access, let's use Dropbox. That's all you need. Or, okay, you, are, you, you also need email and calendars. Well, then this is what Microsoft 365 is. And a lot of times those aha moments just come from explaining things like the difference between Microsoft 365 and Windows 365. And let's talk about Microsoft's like naming schemes and issues with branding, but right. And then like Office 365, which doesn't actually exist and we're just plain Office and perpetual licenses. Like that whole discussion for people of just helping them wrap their brain around how tech companies have named things and what they actually mean they start kind of piecing things together like, oh, so I don't actually need a perpetual license if I'm paying for Microsoft 365. I don't actually need Dropbox if I have SharePoint. Oh, I don't actually need, like, what is Active Directory doing for you if the only thing you ever do is have your users go online and go to Microsoft 365? So, and this might be an odd question, but so how do you yeah. make that? Because I agree. I mean, there's, there is that point where eyes glaze over and People are like, uh, <laughs> they get kind of technology overload. How do you, how do you make that consumable? Do you, do you make an effort to make that consumable for an executive who maybe, let me just say, maybe has a short attention span? For that I mean, <laughs> that's what I was going to ask, Catherine. What prizes do you give out to people? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> understand it once you're explaining it. Um, I think you just, I mean, I, I mean, I just not to like repeat the features or benefits, but it's really that element, right? It's almost like, I, I don't like the term like sales consultant. It's more like we're just consultants, right? Whatever role you are, you're a consultant in your field. And so helping people understand a lot of times it's like the, the best expert in the field that I know, like if they're an expert in their field is because they can explain what they do at like a third grade level, right? To me, you're an expert when you can do that. If you can write a 900, you know, 90 page paper on all this and you can get really, these are all the details, like, okay, cool. You're really smart in your field. But then if you can take that same paper and break it down so that I can understand like physics, <laughs> then I can be like, oh, okay. Well, that's actually not that hard. And so I, I do think that there's, sometimes I'll explain it to a, a client and it's like a little bit of doing it multiple times and having those mistakes where I wait for their eyes to glaze over and I make a joke about it, right? Like, oh crap, like you're looking at me how I talk to my tax and accountant. Like this is, I've, I've lost you. And, and even then, like, it's like taking breaks. Like they'll even, I usually try and get clients to tell me like, are you, have I, are you overwhelmed yet? You know, are you burnt out? So it's kind of a balance of both, but I do think it's just really explaining in a concept of like, what do you care about? Like getting them to explain what they care about. They don't care a lot of times about what I found is that they don't care about what has like the fastest speed. I mean, sometimes they do, but sometimes they care about what has the most accessibility, what has the most, like, where can I work from anywhere? And then, but, you know, talk about like coders, for example, coders, if they lose a couple seconds, that's terrible, right? Seconds to them are, are measured in dollars because of how much a developer might cost. Whereas for somebody else who's in sales, like they're okay losing internet occasionally, but they need to make sure they have access to all their presentations from anywhere in the world when they're traveling. Um, so it's just, I think, getting really clear about, well, what do you care about? And then that's our job as translators, right? Like, okay, let's figure out how technology can be applied there. When you're having those discussions and you're working with somebody who's a business who's contemplating kind of the new landscape, and maybe even after this, we talk a little bit about <clears throat> the new landscape of small to medium-sized business. But when you're mm -hmm. talking with them, how often is their first line of question or their first concern cost versus performance. 
I, I guess it's interesting yeah. because some customers, they, what does it cost? What does it cost? Mm-hmm. Their performance. So I guess I'm just interested from your perspective when you're, when you're working with somebody who's contemplating really changing the whole landscape of their business. It's an evolution, right? It's, we're going from, you know, a tadpole floating in the, uh, you know, the ethereal ooze of the planet to walking on land, right? That's the next step. So what, I guess, like I said, at what point, what does cost come into it? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, cost always matters. Like, I mean, as much as I wish it didn't, I can be like, but it's really cool. Like the cost might matters. <laughs> like, so I think when you're looking, the problem with a lot of these new technologies, like think of just Microsoft 365, everybody bashes, I feel like on subscription models. Oh, I pay for Netflix and I pay for uh, whatever, Amazon Prime and I'm paying for Disney Plus. Like I literally about just had a customer do that. Yep. Right. And so we list these subscription models and then we say like, I just can't believe I'm paying for all this. But then you think of it and you say, okay, well, what did we used to pay for cable, like a cable package? And then that cable package was on one device that you sat on your living room couch, or you paid extra to have it on a different bedroom, you know, in a different room in the house. And then you paid extra for that. And then you had a box there. And I mean, maybe you were lucky enough to have DVR and actually record stuff. So, I mean, you were so limited that the cost is important, but cost per value is the problem is like a lot of times, even, you know, we are small businesses, whoever don't fully realize the value of something. I talk to a lot of customers who are in Google workspace and, you know, ask, what do you do in it? I use, I use email and calendar. That's it. Well, so what are you doing for, you know, why are you paying for Dropbox over here? Is there a compliance issue or box? Is there something about compliance or HIPAA? Like, what are you trying? No, right. They just, it's just really application and understanding what Google Workspace can do. So the value that they perceived of Google Workspace was a lot lower than what it really is. So cost does matter, but it's really that cost per value. So I think in technology, I mean, how many tools are being used that we're not really using the whole value of that tool? We're not using its full potential. So when you're, um, I guess I'll say, when you're putting together a package or when you're yeah. recommending a solution, um, how do you address uh, security? And you mentioned HIPAA, and that was one of the ones that I was actually mm-hmm. thinking about is do you have, how does your recommendation change if it's a HIPAA or PCI covered entity, or does it change when you're talking about those types of businesses? Because like I said, we have customers who are HIPAA, PCI, both, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley. Yeah. So there's different ones. So how do you, does that change your approach or do you have certain, uh, technologies maybe that you recommend or that you feel comfortable with? I mean, there's definitely technologies that are designed with certain things in mind, right? Just like Asana. Well, and or maybe it's a like, methodology. I mean, is there a different methodology yeah. if you're a HIPAA business versus a non-HIPAA business? I mean, with either one, like the initial assessment, like the initial needs assessment, whenever you walk up to a small business and you're talking with them, it's always, what is the need? And tell me, you have kind of either mentally or you actually have a checklist and we have a checklist that says like tell me about your business yes, like, so what's you have most- a checklist no yeah way. of course we have a checklist no way. <laughs> yeah right everyone has checklists <laughs> but it's i mean this idea of just trying to figure out what are you do you have certain compliance and a lot of times i mean kind of going out of order maybe but like the role of the cio cto right now is essentially falling into vendor management, right? So, I mean, it's not necessarily creating technologies out of nothing or card coding things from scratch. It's understanding the thousands of solutions that are out there and actually figuring out how to apply them best for business. So if a bus- if the business is really concerned about different terms of compliance, then it's probably gonna be a different level of license in Microsoft 365, or it might be Box instead of Google Drive. Like, I mean, there's different tools. So that kind of gets more into okay, what are your needs? And then figuring out the right solutions that's out there. And that is very different because there's might be a thousand solutions and maybe two of 200 of them have been vetted, you know, by myself or my team. Then it's kind of figuring out, okay, based off of these requirements, these are kind of our go-to solutions. And then we'd work with those vendors to figure out if it makes sense. What would you say is, and oh wait, do you have, do you have slides that you want to get to? I don't want to take up all of your time. I have. Um, I mean, we can kind of, I'll, Throw them up in a second. Go go right. on and ask that right. question. Then I can. But well, I was going to say, what is the biggest way? What is the largest impact that you feel um, you have to a small to medium sized business? Where do you see the most 
bang for the buck um, that you that you provide? That, mm. um, I think it's kind of to I didn't mean, I didn't the last <laughs> point. Stop well, I mean, so I uh, I love. Um, there's a, there's a guy who wrote this book called the, the Singularity is Near, which I won't go into, but Ray Kurzweil, if you guys have ever heard of him. So he wrote this book and he, I attended one of his talks. Like Interstellar in some ways. I don't know. I mean, I think. He's what? It, it's the like movie Interstellar where we need to understand physics. Well, it's very, it's AI oriented if you're interested and he's kind of a futurist, but one of the things that he talks about um, in his, you know, if you've ever watched him talk is this idea of technology when a new technology comes out, it'll come out, but it's not really ready to be adopted by everyone, right? So it's like, like think of voice to text. When it came out, it drove everyone crazy. It never worked right. Like I, I only people who really used it were early adopters and techies, and we thought it was great, but because we saw the potential in it, but it really wasn't there yet. And then it wasn't until years later when the technology was improved and the devices and mics supported the technology, and then the people actually took the time to understand the technology that it kind of all came together and it actually worked. And then we say, oh, cool, look how great this technology is. And we say, well, it's been around forever. I mean, that technology has been around forever. It's just now actually applicable. Uh, and so I think a lot of times the role, like I said, the kind of the role of CIO and CTO is shifting where like when I am working with companies, it's this idea of technologies have been around forever, but we're making changes and you're making changes and you have new needs that are how can we best apply it? And so instead of one person going out, I mean, I talked to a lot of companies, it's so easy to sign up for a new SaaS or service, cloud-based service. Like today I signed up for Asana. My other team signed up for this HR program. Somebody signed up for this ticket program. And they have 20, 30 programs with users all over the place, with passwords all over the place, data that really coming in and helping just to streamline that. Like what are the different tools out there? How can we actually use them in your business? And then how can we make sure that things are done securely, scalably, remotely, things like that? I don't, so it's more of a consulting role than a right. traditional support role. Uh, hey, my monitor won't turn on. I was going to say, without give, giving you too large of a head, here's the question. Um, do you find that uh, uh, an effect of your involvement in a business actually changes the way the ownership or executive team thinks about their business? Like the, the, not the core I function. So. But, I hope so. Yeah, you know? but it, it, yeah. It, it seems like in some of the things where I'm involved, they haven't contemplated being able to do things in a different way. And that exposure yeah. helps them rethink their yes. business. I think, Ken, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I'm just looking, I guess, a little clarity. You don't actually represent a specific product or service. You go in and evaluate the business, talk to them, communicate, and then come up with a plan that you think would meet their needs, regardless of what vendors they might use? Yeah, I, I mean, um, actually, that's a great segue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up a screen, a slide on my screen. Ken's awesome for that. He's great at segues. I want my $5 later. <laughs> Let's see if I can. All right, is that showing on my screen okay? Yep. Um, so that, I mean, my initial goal, like when I'm working with a company is to say, you have functions, you have fundamental processes that you're trying to do in your business. And we all, we all pretty much have them, right? We're all doing some form of email communications, collaboration, calendars. We have documents, we have some type of specific industry software application that we might be using that uh, we care about antivirus and patches, right? So what is it in your business that you're doing and what are your processes? And then kind of to, to go back to your saying, I consider myself brand agnostic. I mean, there's definitely, I think if you're falling into a consultant role, you should vet out the solutions you're recommending. So they've, I don't, it's very rare that I'm going to say, hey, here's this. I, I've never done it. Like, even if a client says, have you heard of this? Then I would go through a vetting process and get demos and work with the vendors and try and learn about it and then give a best recommendation that we could. Um, but so I think it's going into that's kind of the difficult role that we're in, I think, in technology is there's so many solutions that are out there right now. There's not just one OS that everyone's using. It's thousands of services. So I think every company tries to take the ones that they've tested the most and say, okay, Microsoft 365 and Google Workspaces are the two top productivity suites in the industry right now. Zoho One, you can make an argue for, for some businesses. Um, so that's basically how I would kind of start of 
all the different processes that you're doing in your business, how can technology support those processes? Nice. So you kind of put together a suite S U I T, not S W E T. Both, but yeah. <laughs> a, a suite of a suite of tools that are relevant for that business. And you know, I think of it almost the way you describe it. I think of it as a spice rack. A little bit of garlic, a little bit of cinnamon. Although I don't know why you'd put garlic and cinnamon in the same recipe, but <laughs> maybe you're trying to fight vampires with cinnamon. I don't know if there's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but you 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 listen to that business and what their needs are, and then you come up to a solution that's relevant to them. Oh uh, yes, absolutely. And that's critical, right? I mean it it because the solution slash the story needs to be relevant for that customer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it isn't a necessarily a cookie cutter. I mean, there's probably technologies that you use. There's technologies you feel comfortable with, I'm sure, uh, tried and true, but they might be a different mix for each or for a business, depending on what their needs or their core focus is, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think, I think that's the, the key thing is, are there pillars of technology that you could argue every small business needs? Such as, and even this obviously is still arguable, but you know, in the past, I would say right now it'd be, okay, every small business in a cloud-based environment needs an end user device, whether that's a tablet or a computer, needs internet connection, and needs some type of software application that they're actually gonna interact with their data with. And then they need data. They need their own inputs that they're putting into that software. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if you kind of can say there's these four basic areas that businesses need and then for each of those different areas then you can have the conversation that says well what type of device do you need do your sales agents actually need lenovo idea what it think pads and these types of or did they just need an ipad that they can jump on a presentation with real quick um you know and even down to <laughs> things like chromecast i mean think of like if you still have a physical office and you want to collaborate then it's having discussions like i mean not i love remote work but i love smart offices so you can have remote work that takes place anywhere, but then if you have a physical office location and you want to say, hey, four hours out of the week or four hours out of the day, you have to come into the office or two, three days a week, you have to come into the office, then how can you make that office smart and start using internet of things? And that opens up a whole new door, right? How I mean, do, you, so how do just, you make it inviting? Yeah, right. I mean, even to the point of, I've talked with clients who talk about having digital photo frames that people can share a desk, but then change out their pictures with their own family members when they're at that desk. I mean, it's little things like that of, you don't have to remove the personalness of things just because you're not wow. that same, you know, That's traditional That's work. Good. You're a technology maniac. That's great. I never <laughs> even thought of that. Completely but, I mean, go out of control. That's good. I, <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah. And people care about those things, right? I mean, we want to oh, see yeah. the personal element of it when we, even if we're using technology in new ways. <laughs> that, that, but that's a neat idea. To go back to your very beginning, it takes a lot to kind of get, I mean, everybody, we all, it's hard to change sometimes. So it takes a lot to just to kind of rethink, hey, <laughs> to go back to my subscription example, when we have all these different subscriptions we're paying for, okay, but if you're using if you're still sitting at your on your couch and you're looking at your TV and that's the only way you ever watch TV, then I'd probably argue all of these subscriptions are probably overwhelming to how you watch TV. But when you consider changing the way you actually work, and people, I know tons of people who don't own a TV. They use it on computers. They use it on tablets and phones. They're in their car. They're downloading things onto it. They completely change the way they work. Suddenly, those subscription services really aren't that much anymore because they're they're able to use it so much. And so it's it's really also having that business change discussion of how can you change the way you think about work? Do your employees have to work nine to five? You know, can they work four in the office and then pick their own hours? You know, would that make it's, more things more flexible? Yeah, it's the pivot to the deliverable versus the task, right? Yes. You know, that's, that's thinking about your business in a different way. The deliverable and the date is important, not the tasks. Well, the tasks are important, but that's not the focus area anymore. Yeah, the focus oh, yeah. is the deliverable in a date. Mm, very interesting. Can I ask you kind of a selfish question? Sure. Well, not very selfish. Maybe it's a little self-serving. So, so what role do you see? So, so you're kind of the innovator. You're the business change catalyst person. You're recommending this new tool set. So in the changing world of business, in a changing 
uh, landscape, even, you know, because of COVID or any number of things. I think COVID helped us learn that we can work in a new way, right? I mean, COVID was what pushed us over the edge, but I think companies are learning they can work in a new way. So in this brave yes. new world, what role do you see or do you think an MSP like Nevi Bro can play in that to help the businesses with their transitions? Any thoughts? Like I said, that's a selfish question. No, I'm going to pull up. How can IT professionals best support small businesses? I'm going to pull My up. goodness, we're connected at the brain. That's a, I'm, I'm, um, second, I'm second to Mr. Romer in my segue capabilities. He's the great <laughs> master, but I'm, I'm a close second. Uh, so I do, I think the role of MSP or IT consultant, whatever, and I've heard, we all have new names. I, I saw an MSP rebrand themselves and now they call themselves modern work consultants. They so I used their, to be, when I was in high school, I was a stock boy, but I decided that I was calling myself a food movement technician. Right. <laughs> I, I love it, right? Like it's the same function is taking place. We as, as, as technology enthusiasts, we're looking at the tech that's available and we're figuring out how to best use it in business. That need is still there. Support needs are still there. Vendor, you know, in terms of the support, I, these are my kind of three areas that I see the biggest need for IT consultants, MSPs, modern work consultants, you know, food management, whatever you said you were called, <laughs> you know, like yeah. these are the roles I, I think are most important. One is that <laughs> consultant consultation and planning of pe people who are, when you're running your business as an operations manager, you want to run your business. You want to develop processes. You want to figure out what work needs to get done. So the tools and how that gets done should be coming from CIO, CTO type roles who ideally have a seat at the table. I mean, an MSP, IT consultant type role should have a seat in the virtual Zoom room or at the table, so to speak, of what's happening in your business and can we help technology support that? Um, and then the two biggest elements that I think from a now we're not necessarily patching things or patching servers, we're not necessarily going on site and running physical cables in the same way, uh, would be one vendor management. I mean, there are thousands of vendors out there, like I said, anywhere from RMM who are doing end user type management software to antivirus to Microsoft 365, how do you manage compliance? I mean, everything, right? So figuring out if you've ever, I mean, have you ever sat on help desk with any of those types of tools? I mean, sat in their chat room or tried to call them. So I think the place for MSPs is that, think of Google and Microsoft 365 as a great example. You're probably not just gonna call somebody if you are an operations manager of a 20 employee company. You don't have anyone at Google or Microsoft 365 to actually help you most likely. So there's no support number. So that MSP middleman becomes crucial that basically says, hey, I am your point of contact. You don't need to go to 30 different people because you have 30 tools that you use. Those are just applications. They're just, just like you would have had software on your computer previously. You're still coming to us. We're going to still reach out to those vendors. One, we're going to be the first line, you know, tier one support. So if we can figure out how to add a user or how to do a Salesforce question that you might have or QuickBooks online. I mean, you're seeing what used to be, you know, maybe like Cisco or some type of firewall certification. Now you might have Salesforce certification members on your team that you have that first tier one, tier two type support in your office ready to go. And then if it goes into the next level, well, now Salesforce is willing to work with you directly because they know you're a partner of theirs. You're an MSP they're not working with the 20 employee end user, right? So there's this crucial, I think, vendor management. And then the hardware component would be, you still need internet access and you still have end user devices. You still have computers or phones or tablets, uh, whether that's bring your own device policy or corporate, you know, corporate provided devices, uh, a lot of that support and help desk would still be there. That was a great point right there, uh, Catherine, that I'd like to expose a little bit. How how often or how prevalent is the bring your own device space? Is it become, is it growing or is it shrinking? Just out of curiosity. I thought it was going to grow 10 years ago. I thought I saw it starting to grow. Yeah. And then I feel like everyone was like, wait, this is a terrible idea <laughs> because I, I wouldn't want to support. I personally don't like the idea of supporting personal devices. Too much so, variability. Right. So I would say when, when I'm working with small businesses, my general recommendation would be you know, just while you might get benefit by not having a physical office and there's a benefit to having remote teams, there's still expectations as an employer. And one of those I do think is providing corporate devices and having an RMM or, you know, remote management type software on there, having antivirus on there, being able to say, hey, this just isn't working. I'm going to ship you a new computer. You're going to ship that back to me and we're going to get you working tomorrow. Right. Because that's the other thing that we're in with cloud services. 
If all they need is a browser and internet connection, then let's just ship them a new computer and stop spending all this time on fixing the computer that they're on. You can't do that when it's a personal device. Right. Uh, the it's only, a real the, security problem as well. I mean, yeah. if, if you have no control of that device, it goes anywhere, it holds anything that the company assets are. Yes. So then the only way I see that working, and I, I don't feel like the technology is quite there yet and the price isn't quite there yet, is like desktop as a service by, you know, Amazon works, Amazon AWS has, uh, what do they call it? Their workspaces, which is essentially desktop as a service where I have my own personal computer, but I click on the virtual computer and it remotes me into a remote computer, you know, a virtual computer. But even that, I just don't know if that's worth it. It just seems like the price of computers are so cheap. I would rather just buy my end user's computer and have it corporate owned. Right, right, awesome. Are there any questions or uh, Catherine, is there anything that I missed? I know I, know I asked a lot of questions because that's, that's how I am, but is there anything more you'd like to talk about? Um, yeah, let me kind of go through, I just wanted, to talk, I mean, a lot of this stuff, like we kind of went through out of order. So I, I'll just kind of summarize some of the key points that, uh, let me actually, let me present this mode so it's a little bit bigger. Uh, but one thing I love to talk to small businesses on of the idea of when technology really was invented, like the cloud. I mean, we all talk about the cloud right now, but I mean, you know, if you've kind of been watching the tech world, the concept of the cloud, I mean, back in 1961, the first, there was a, a MIT speech given by John McCarthy of basically saying that computing would be sold like a utility, right? I mean, that was back in the 60s. The 70s, the first time the cloud is used and the World Wide Web comes out. The first SaaS company comes out in 1996. So I love just kind of putting things in perspective that this has been around, the concept of the cloud and cloud services in particular have been around for a while. But we're seeing is this kind of sweet spot of it's finally accessible enough. The internet's finally fast enough. Devices are finally cheap enough. And the, the biggest thing, you know, we talk about this shift going to the digital workplace, you know, what's causing, and a lot of people are saying, you know, COVID's causing remote work and all these things. And COVID is definitely a catalyst, right? The cloud is, you know, it's been a, a catalyst that we were, we were kind of seeing the benefits of remote work, but the technology itself has been around forever, not forever, but, you know, 50 plus years now. Um, we kind of went all this of cloud services. And then I just wanted to talk about this right here with the idea of what does matter. And I'd love to kind of open this up as a group. So we're sitting here and now we say, okay, we're gonna take all of these servers and we're gonna move them all to services. So now I have a computer, like a physical computer that I'm supporting. I have the internet. I go on the internet, I go access my software. So as a manager, what's kind of like the most important element there? And to me, I always think about how important this puts on our data. Because now I'm not managing, I manage my own end user hardware, but I'm not managing the server hardware anymore, not managing the operating system, the patches, not managing even the software updates. Literally the, the only thing that I have really going in here for my employees is my data. And I just like to point out like how critical I think that puts on our data of making sure that it's actually correct, that it's valid, that it's clean, that it integrates with other services, I mean, backed up. I mean, so a lot of times I see with cloud services is we just put it in the cloud and we say, we're all good, we're using a cloud service of backing that data up. There's still ways of kind of backing it up. So, I mean, I loved kind of thoughts or Keith, if you have any thoughts on how does that kind of put an emphasis or change what we care about most? How do we protect our data, back it up and things like that? Yeah, it's, that's a very good discussion because a lot of times people don't, don't they assume because their data is in the cloud that it's backed up or it's being backed up. And one of the, the, the things that we found is that customers are not backing it up. And, and once presented with that, they want to do it. And it almost, it almost in some ways flips the model upside down where instead of having their servers and stuff on premise, um, and backing up to the cloud, they're having their servers yes. in the cloud and then backing up on premise, <laughs> kind of a, a different way of thinking about it. And, and yeah, I say, and, and whether it's uh, the data in the cloud or it's, you know, even like Office 365 and those types of things, uh, um, when, when they understand that that's just not kind of part of the deal that you have to still back those things up, they kind of, that's one of those aha moments that 
<laughs> the moment of panic, you see them to go, oh, wait a minute, you know, and, and, and helping them find those tools. I just recently went through that where I didn't realize that Office 365 was not backing up my email. I just assumed it was redundant and was all over the world and multiple areas and if something ever happened, but then it was like uh, an eye opener, really, it's not. That is like, so going back to, like you said, aha moments and educating uh, operations managers and clients is really thinking that through. If there's a difference between data syncing and data being backed up, right? And as soon as, if you're syncing across devices and, you know, like your email, your email synced across devices and you're deleting it in one place or your kid gets access to your phone, had this happen, you know, a child get access to a phone and delete a folder on that Google Drive photos, of your backups, you just lost it everywhere. And if you're lucky, Dropbox or Google Drive will send you an email that says, hey, 100 gigs was just deleted. Was this on purpose? You know, if you're lucky, you'll get some type of notification, but there's a good it's chance. Interesting that, that you say that. We had a, we did a power lunch a couple months ago on the difference between syncing images and backups. It was one of, it was a interesting one, interesting conversation. That's, I mean, that has been huge. So, and I, the talking about switching the model upside down. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and that's, like when people think about like OneDrive and they're syncing stuff, it's yes. exactly what you said. They make a mistake or they delete a file in one place and they're like, oh, I'll just go here. And no, you're not going to do that because it's sync. <laughs> it's yes. a synchronization. So, yeah. I mean, yep. syncing, the cloud, I, what's that? Talking about the cloud and the origin of the cloud, my wife, who's not a very technical person, made a great observation. She said, this whole cloud thing, isn't that just like your web email, like Yahoo Mail and I have a Hotmail account. That's been around forever. You know, uh, AOL was one of the first ones that had, you know, mail stored on a server somewhere. So, was, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like, literally. I mean, the, the simplest definition I ever give with the cloud is the cloud is just doing whatever you do somewhere else. So whatever you do on your computer or a server, if you're a business, you know, your server is just a business computer. So whatever you do on a computer, the cloud just means taking that computer and sticking it somewhere else. And making it somebody else's responsibility. So where where do you come in at it? And I, yeah, I mean, I think that that's for a lot of people, that's the simplest way of looking at it. And kind of going back, I mean, syncing, syncing to me is for convenience. Backing up is for security. So like you have to have both, right? The syncing element is really just so that you can say, I can work from anywhere. Oh, and there's obviously there's elements of security in that if I don't have to have things on my physical device and I lose it awesome, right? Then I just lost it. I'm not stressed out about, did I have things on my local hard drive? Um, but I think that's just a huge discussion with clients of, you know, your data. To me, I, I'm of the philosophy that if I'm working with a company, a SaaS services-based company, they are providing hardware, they're providing software and updates. I'm renting out the ability to interface with my data in a new way. So that's kind that of benefit. Down, What's that? I just wrote that down. Syncing is for convenience backup is for security that's a great that's a great one i i, I will plagiarize that you can plagiarize, yeah, plagiarize. <laughs> that, that's a good one i like the way you i like the way you thought of that yeah so um so that and then let me just jump over i think that was pretty much that i mean this is just the idea of you know you don't have your hardware you don't have your operating system you don't have the software coding that you're doing you you're just left with that data and how important that is um and then i'll end with this quote here. Um, Technology should work with the work, should support the work you're doing today and what you're doing tomorrow. I mean, this is the biggest thing with, with clients. I mean, the idea of when you buy physical servers, a lot of times we're, we're doing capital expenditures with the idea that I'm gonna have this technology for the next three to five years. I'm gonna have this physical server in my infamous server room for the next three to five years. And we have no idea what technology is gonna be invented tomorrow. But you're making that investment and you're going to be stuck with that server for the next three to five years. Uh, so if I can you know, get people to kind of understand technology moves so quickly that while we don't know what's coming, if we can design it in a way that's scalable, that's flexible and allows us to kind of grow down the road, then at least it gives you room to kind of adapt easily as technology changes. Awesome. I, a, a thought. How do you address people that may have a concern about they're losing control of their data. Like it's, it's, it's not here. It's not in my server room. I used to be able to walk back there and touch it. And now it's somewhere in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So one would be the, 
soft, this is like the idea of like vetting your companies is, and even with the companies we know, we have this discussion of who owns data. You know, what, what are they, when we use a software company and we sign their privacy rights, what are we giving them the rights to do with our data, whether that's anonymous or with our name on it? You know, so I think one, helping them understand when you go out and you find some random software company that you're using and it seems really cool, that could just be somebody in their you know, basement running some server because software is so easy to create right now. So one is, I think, just having the discussion of managing, managing your data properly in the first place, of that it's you know, accurate, clean, integrated, and then also that it's with a company that you can be trusted the best we can. I mean, that's obviously what we're trying to figure out. Uh, and then two, if a server, so kind of go back to the original question, do, can we run a small business without any servers? If I were going to have a server, it would be to back up my data on site or in my own hands. I mean, so right here, I mean, that's a NAS, right? So I have, I have a NAS that backs up. That it's looks like a Synology NAS. It is a Synology NAS, yeah, 12 frequent, terabytes. Frequent guests of the power lunch. Yes. <laughs> um, and to me, it was, it's a way to say, now for me, I, this is a personal NAS in this case, because this is, you know, pictures and things like that and videos and, but it's a way of saying, okay, this personal application, but you know, if I have my computer or my phone that has pictures on it and I can back it up to Google Cloud and do Google Photos, and then I can do a, another backup over here with iDrive, but then I still don't feel good about that. I still want to have those, then I'm gonna get a NAS and I'm gonna put my own backup and have it there and, and do, a, do a true backup, right? Not a sync, do a true backup on the NAS. Um, so I think talking, there's kind of two options for backups. One would be, I would never, I would hope that with SaaS, I think more companies, Salesforce just did this, where when you look at like data SaaS protection and backupify and those types of tools, we're able to back up Microsoft 365 and back up Google Workspaces. That's the most common. We're starting to be able to back up Salesforce and Box and Dropbox. We're starting to be able to back up software as a services. So I hope more SaaS or cloud services company make it easy to back up my data that lives with their tools. So for now, what it ends up being is one of the top things I vet for with the SaaS program is can I export my data or are they trapping me with their software? So if I can go into their backend in any form, if I can go in there and export and think of like Asana, which is a project management tool. Uh, if I can go in and export my Excel spreadsheets, then at a minimum, I can say, okay, once a quarter, I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna export all the data that I use from that tool. And I'm gonna put that in a folder for quarterly backup. And that might be in the cloud, or like I said, if depending on the client, it might be on the cloud and on a local NAS. But and that, that was one of the things, actually, that's one of the reasons that Synology has been a frequent guest was because they put that ability to back up your Office 365 stuff yes. natively in their app. I mean, Synology in the past was one of those things that was kind of like, ah, uh, you know, wide, deep, low, and slow, all that, not really taken seriously, but the first uh time they were in a power lunch they showed the capability that they put in their software to do the backups of the google workspace and uh, microsoft 365 i mean people on the, the lunch were like whoa that's, right that's a whole different that's a different layer that's a whole different conversation now but that thing has now just become uh, a great utility so and think about that for like any cloud services, you know, the more, I mean, just like we have some tools that integrate like Zapier. I mean, if you get like Zapier, which is a yeah. integration tool, right? Integration. I mean, something like that, that says, Hey, I can integrate with any software as a service that's on Zapier. And I can say, take that data and back it up to a Synology NAS. And it just gives me a way of, and one thing, a big kind of like when we talk about educating, you know, clients and small businesses is helping them understand when we look at software as a service, the back end of that is a database. That database is made up of spreadsheets. So when we think of like, if your data can't be organized or thought about on an Excel spreadsheet, it's probably not gonna be organized and thought about in a software as a service, you know, software company, right? Cause that software is just a way of integrating or interacting with your spreadsheet. So if we can find a way to export that data from that tool, that spreadsheet is what really has the basic information that you care most about. So that's what we're trying to get to, right? So, but once you have that spreadsheet, you can't do anything with it except from, unless you have to, right? And the goal is that you have that software company, but if that software company ever went down for some reason, 
I want a way to be able to at least say, okay, if it was a CRM, who were my clients? What was my last phone call with them? What was this? What was that? Right. I mean, you just need some way of pulling that raw data. Catherine, Paul had to bounce over to a different meeting, but he asked if you would be able to give a demo. And I'm, so I'm not sure what that entails. And I know we're at the end of our time. So I don't know if that's possible, but is that something that you could do for us? Um, a demo of like a certain tool? Well, see, that was what Paul said. Yeah, I think, so, I I think, think probably that, see that uh, as possible because you don't really, you're a consultant. There's nothing really to demo. I think that if Catherine's willing to do it, one thing that I would be interested in is a couple weeks down the road, maybe we have see if she's willing to come back and give us a cool, I don't know if I want to say cool tools, but uh, give us an overview on some of the things that that the tools that she works with or kind of uh, an overview of some of her favorite uh, solutions maybe. And uh, oh, yeah. if, like I said, if you're willing to do that, I, I, I've had, a, this has been a great session. I mean, actually I didn't even do the Netby Pro after hours today. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, no, I mean, if you're willing to do that, I think that people would be very interested to see, you know, maybe we identify, um, and, and it's kind of interesting, I actually have a slide at our pillars of technology. You used that phrase earlier, I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So Never maybe we that. maybe we identify a couple of different pillars and a couple of solutions in each one, knowing that it's not um, the only one that's out there, but maybe some things that you like and, and why. And then, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about how I guess I would like to talk a little bit about if someone is interested in working with you, what's the best way to do that? Maybe give us a few minutes on that. How, if, it, you know, cause, cause you're doing this as a service. So is it just go out to the website and fill out a form or what's the best way to, to work with you? Yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, so, so and geography doesn't matter, right? That's the goal, right? I mean, that's kind of the, right, yeah. the premise that I would work with clients all over the country and, um, so in terms of the tools, yes, absolutely. I mean, so uh, internally, I call that basically a small business toolbox of, okay, these are the tools that I like the most for these certain functions that I think every business needs, um, whether that's antivirus and like I said, productivity suites, calendar scheduling, whatever it might be. Um, one thing to speak to that on is just to kind of think about is there's there's business suites. I talked to a lot of people about what is an ERP? What is a business suite? What are best in class software? I mean, so that's the initial discussion with software I like to, for people to think about is there are business suites that do everything all in one and you might be giving up some stuff because, but you get the benefit that it's one software vendor, one database, you know, things are really kind of well integrated or you get best in class where it's the best project management tool, the best CRM, you're sitting there trying to integrate it. Uh, so yes, on that, we can, we can talk more about that. And then in terms of reaching out, uh, just www.adabyfig, which I'll throw on the screen real quick. Uh, but it's basically, uh, I start with just a conversation of, with businesses of what is it that you're trying to do? Uh, what is it that you're wanting to accomplish? Um, you know, do you, is it practical? Like with this discussion, you know, is it practical to go serverless? Or are there certain applications or functions in your business that really make sense to have an element of, I'm not trying to convince the whole world that they need to go serverless. I think that there's a place for it. But if it makes sense for a business to go into the cloud or go more serverless and use some of these services, then we'd love to have that discussion. Or if it's purpose-driven, I mean, yes. there might be certain oh, applications that. that make sense to purpose-driven uh, a service. Uh, I mean, that, that's great. Yes. No, absolutely. It should, it should be, technology should be intentional and purpose-driven. That's my two favorite words for that. Nice. See, again, again, oh. we got the <laughs> yes. brain connection. Sorry about, sorry about the brain connection. I apologize for my <laughs> impact. So sorry about it. I love it. I'll try to do better. Um, all right. Very good. Any other questions for Catherine? Just, Not. Just, uh, I'm sorry if I interrupt too much and oh, answer a lot of questions. I, I no, it's good. It's perfect. No, it's, Mr. Romer, your input is always valued, man. Very sure. good. Love it. Yeah. No, I appreciate it, Catherine. Time flew. I mean, this was yeah. a great, great information, and uh, we'll have to get together again. I actually made another note that uh, we'll come up with a, a session again in a few weeks, and uh, um, yeah, that'd, that'd be very good. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Well, thanks, everybody. We're coming to the end here. I appreciate all of your uh, 
uh, attending. And, and if you have any questions, uh, get a hold of Catherine. Or if you want help getting a hold of her, you can show, shoot me an email, and I'd be glad to put you guys in contact, and and, uh, and we can go from there. But thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.